this morning, I'm going to talk about letting go. And this is an important topic, I feel. We hold on to so much negative emotions, memories, the past, good times and bad times. And frequently, we would prefer to hold on and remember the bad times as opposed to the good times. It's all in our mind. And if you really can look at this logically, and it's very difficult to be logical, because as human beings, we tend to be emotional. But if we look at it logically, why hold on to things that make you feel bad? It's that simple. We want to be happy, but we have a very difficult time of letting go of things we feel are negative. The past is gone. It can't come back. Memories are just, you might say, the play of the mind. And it's amazing if you look into memories, you can see the same thing from a different perspective. You can go back to things that have happened in the past and now look at them as an adult. Here is a story. When I was I think in the second or third grade, it was Halloween, and we all were supposed to go to school in a costume. And mom made a bunny costume out of my pajamas, the kind with a flap in the back. And all day long, I had to go to school in front of my friends with these pajamas with a flap in the back. And I was so embarrassed. And a few years ago, I went to Ecuador to visit a friend. And while I was there, they had a parade. Let's see if I can get this picture up. Because in this parade, they had a group of people that the um, the theme of their section was sanitation. You see the boy there dressed as a toilet? He had no problem dressing as a toilet. And that made me realize that maybe I could go back in that memory and give it a different interpretation. So much of our memories are like this. We're really seeing from a very narrow perspective. Anyway, what happens is that through what we have experienced in the past and our interpretations, what we experienced in the past, we develop habitual patterns, or another name is karma. We receive what in the West they would call mental conditioning, and this remains. And the thing is, we need room to grow. If our mind is full of all this stuff, there's no room to grow. And all of this happens in relative reality, and relative reality is nothing but interpretations, viewpoints, opinions, and so forth. I've said this many times, but I'm going to go over it again. This singing bowl, I got this from my parents. They visited India and Nepal. They probably got it there. They had a potted plant inside of it. They saw it as something to use for a potted plant to keep the water from coming out and staining the table. Of course, we look at it as a singing bowl. Now, Ellie has a support animal. If I would fill it full of water and put it on the floor, the dog would see it as a bowl of water. And if I took it to a junk dealer, he would assess the metal and weigh it and then say it's worth so much. And who's right? Well, we're, they're all right in terms of relative reality. It's what you project onto the object is what it is with our experience, our past. But we experience in the present, and it is our memories of the past that we hold on to and can't let go of. The Tibetans say the past is like a rotten seed. Nothing can grow from it, and that the future is like the child of a barren woman, that the future hasn't happened yet. So change can only happen in the present. We can only let go in the present. On the other hand, our actions of body, speech, and mind in the present can have a dramatic effect on 
the future. Freedom is in the present. Freedom in the present, being able to make choices that are not controlled by habitual patterns and karma, and being able to let go. Letting go is a very, very powerful tool for change. I have a few things here that I would list under what we can let go of. I would say, first of all, any of our afflictive emotions, our attachment, our especially strong attachment, our aversion and anger, our pride, our jealousy, our greed. And then, of course, there is our ignorance, wanting to ignore, you might say, the elephant in the room. We can let go of fear and anxiety that these cause a tremendous amount of problems. And then, of course, the whole basis of all of this is our ego fixation, thinking that we are a separate, independent individual that is not affected at some level by other people in our environment. So then, why let go? Why even consider this? Well, for one thing, you will be happier and be more content. You'll be doing other people a favor because you'll be nicer to them. So you're benefiting yourself and you're benefiting others. And because we're all interdependent, these two are really not separate. We're starting from the point of view that we still see ourselves as an independent entity. And we work with that and gradually go in the direction of seeing ourselves as interdependent. So the first step is to be aware of the presence in our minds of any of these things, especially our afflictive emotions and then fear and anxiety. If we're not aware of their presence, we can't work with them. My favorite analogy is PS, and it automatically enters where you are located, and then you enter where you want to go. Well, as Buddhists, we know where we want to go, but we have to know where we are before we can apply the techniques to get us to where we want to go. So we need to be aware of our mind, what's on our mind right now. So a good start is to be more aware, to observe our mind more. And you might find by doing this, even if it's every once in a while during the day, we hold on to the trivial and ignore the important. We're more oriented towards short-term aims and ignore the long-term goal. A way to start would be meditation, where we place our mind on an object, and when we get distracted, we return back to the object. The, The common one is the object being the breath. The breath is subtle and can be difficult to follow, and you can be easily distracted. If that's the case, it may be that you need something that is less subtle, more obvious, and it could be a statue of the Buddha, for instance. It could be a tanka, or it could be a picture, something like that, and just look at it. Don't judge it. We're not doing art appreciation here. We're just looking at it. And when our mind wanders, then bring the mind back to the object that you are looking at. This could be done with any of our senses. It could be done with a sound. I can't do that here because Zoom mutes the sound of a singing bowl but it could be done with the sound of a singing bowl. It could be the sound of mantra. could be taste. When I'm talking to a group of people that may be new to meditation, I frequently bring raisins and pass out raisins to everybody, and then we taste a raisin and mindfully eat the raisin. So it could be anything that our five senses 
are aware of. As I said, it is watching the breath or being aware of the breath that is most commonly practiced, but these others are just fine. The idea is that as we are being aware of whatever the object of the meditation is, thoughts arise. Maybe fear arises, plans, the past arises, future, self-loathing, whatever comes to mind, and then off our mind goes. Eventually, we become aware of the fact that we are not following the object of meditation. So then we have to be vigilant. And as soon as we are aware of that, come back to the object of meditation. It's doing it in a way that is non judgmental. It's just realizing this is what was going on, and I'm going to go back to the breath and do it as best that you can without thoughts, without feeling like you've done something wrong without judgment, just come back. So with meditation, there is mindfulness, which is of the technique, following the breath or the object that you are placing your awareness on. And then there is awareness, which is being aware of more things, like whether you are following the breath or whatever the object is. And then there is vigilance, which when you are become aware you're not following the object, brings you back right away without judgment. What happens is these afflictive emotions and fear and so forth become so powerful that we feel sometimes like they're stronger than we are. But we can work with these things. We can train our mind. We can tame our mind to let go of these. It may take a long time before you realize that I have not been following the object of meditation, but eventually you come back, even if it's once in an hour. And the more you do that, the stronger good habit comes, and the weaker the bad habit of giving in to the conflicting emotions and fear and aversion and so forth. We're not trying to get rid of thoughts. If we try to get rid of thoughts, it actually gives them more power. So we're just trying to recognize when we're thinking and then come back to the object of meditation. So that's a brief explanation of using meditation on an object to help tame our minds. Now, the good news is that our minds can be tamed, and I'm going to contrast this with a dog, because in a way, there's a similarity between a dog looking out a window and seeing a squirrel, and us meditating and then having some very powerful, painful thought come up. Both immediately distract us. I was staying one time with some friends. This was down in Florida. I was there giving talks, and so I stayed with them, and they had a dog, and they had a big patio door, and on the other side of the patio door, there was open space, and they had a squirrel, and they called the squirrel mayhem because the squirrel would taunt the dog, knew that the dog couldn't get it, and it would be there in the door taunting the dog, and the dog was going crazy. That's kind of like an untamed mind when very powerful thought comes up. We just kind of lose it. But we can tame our mind by practicing over and over and over again. We're not helpless. Now, another strategy is to replace this negative thought, regardless of what it is, whether it is an emotion of fear, anxiety, jealousy, When you become aware of it, this is when you're not meditating, but just going about your daily life and you become aware of this disturbing thought coming up. Now, normal samsaric behavior is to get busy doing something else so that you don't see that. For men, it might be getting involved in sports, watching, you know, the football game, might be getting on 
the internet and ordering stuff on Amazon. Could be going to the mall. I had a woman that would come here many years ago for Buddhist practice and teachings and so forth. But she liked to clean house. Now, I don't know why she liked to clean house, but she offered to clean mine. And I said, go for it. Even house cleaning can be a way to, you might say, keep busy enough so that these fearful thoughts don't come up very often. But we can kind of, you might say, change that kind of behavior a little bit. And that is when a painful or fearful or disturbing thought comes up, do mantra. O mani pemi hung, o mani pemi hung. Or replace it with a positive thought. Think about a time when you were happy when you felt good about the situation that you were in. Again, this depends on you being aware of what's causing you problems, what's disturbing your mind. If we can replace it with a positive thought, that can help. It helps us let go of the negative thoughts, and it helps us develop these positive patterns. So when you're angry at someone, Uh, Think of someone that you love, not too complicated. If you are angry at yourself, let's say you're depressed, well, start thinking about things that you like about yourself or things that you have done that have been beneficial to other people. Uh, It's amazing how we can spend hours going over our faults and all of our bad behavior. And when it comes to things that we have done that are beneficial to us and beneficial to other people, we just can't think of anything. There's an analogy in uh, Tibetan Buddhism about our mind, and that is that our minds are like a vast, deep ocean. And the waves are on the surface of the ocean. And our thoughts are like these waves. So you can also realize what is the nature of our mind is very vast, very deep. That love is very deep. The disturbing emotions that we have are really just ripples on the surface of a very deep ocean. So this is another tactic or method of working with letting go of things. Again, here is a personal story. I'm forgetful. Many years ago when I was suffering from depression, I would really get down on myself for forgetting. One day I realized what was happening was when I would get down on myself, I was getting down on myself when I was remembering. If I truly forgot it, it would it be gone. It like it never happened. But I was remembering, and then I would go, oh, I forgot, and then yada yada yada, the self-criticism. Actually, what you want to do when you remember is to encourage remembering and getting down on yourself and being very critical of yourself, feeling guilty about a quality that you want to encourage is, shall we say, counterproductive. So now another way to look at letting go is, again, using mindfulness, but not necessarily on the cushion when you're meditating, but investigating. And notice that when you are thinking that it has parts. It's not a solid thought. There are sensations that you might have in your body. Maybe some people can see images, even maybe remember sounds. And then, of course, there are always beliefs how to interpret whatever this memory is. You can start looking at these different parts and realize that they have to come together in a certain way before you have this emotion, this anxiety, and so forth. They're all interdependent. 
if you can start seeing the parts and maybe the cracks between the parts, they start functioning as a unit and they lose some of their power and realize that there's nothing that is permanent, that things are always changing. As I said at the beginning, we can give new interpretations to old experiences. And so if we look at the parts and pieces to see that they are constantly changing, it's only our mind that is not changing. And if we actually look at our mind, we'll find that even it changes, that it goes up and down, up and down, up and down. Some days we're up, other days we're down, some mornings we're down, in the afternoon we're up and so on and so forth. All of this is fluctuating and changing. There is a view from the top of a mountain versus the view in a narrow valley. If we investigate our mind and our beliefs, our opinions, and so forth, frequently we realize that we're looking as if we were in a narrow valley. If we can you might say put a little distance between ourselves and the emotion and so forth. Things can look very, very differently. I like to use the term reverse engineering. So when you start looking at the parts, you can see how you put them together. Another way of letting go is through forgiveness. We forgive in the present what has happened in the past so that there is room to grow in the future. There are three objects of forgiveness and three slightly different types of forgiveness. First of all, we can forgive ourselves. It's amazing how much we can hold on to in terms of judging ourselves negatively. I should have, I could have, I wish I would have. I'm a bad person because I didn't, or because I did, and so on and so forth. So we can learn to let go of these negative judgments of ourselves and realize that we don't improve through having a long list of negative things that we have done. This just keeps us stuck, keeps us holding on to the past. Then we can work with people that we have hurt. You don't have to talk to these people, but I like to do a visual exercise where you visualize a person that you've hurt that you would like them to forgive you. Visualize them in front of you. Think about what it is that you did that harmed them. And then it's like Tong Len, you inhale that harm in the form of black smoke. And then when you exhale, you exhale the antidote to that harm that you caused them. It could be as simple as you realize that you got mad at them and that hurt their feelings. And so you would inhale that hurt and you would exhale to them your happiness. Give them happiness. And then the third type of forgiveness is forgiving a person that you are angry with because of something that they did. Pema Chodron talks about anger this way. Anger is like drinking rat poison and expecting the rat to die. We realize that anger hurts us more than the person we are angry at. It becomes easier to let go of it. If we can't forgive ourselves, how in the heck can we know how to forgive others? So we have to start with forgiving ourselves, being kind to ourselves. And that brings up another form of letting go. I just call it kindness towards ourselves. It's okay to be kind to ourselves, to nurture ourselves. Actually, this is where we start. I like to use the example of uh, two different kinds of mothers, and these are purely fictional, and they're opposites. The one mother, the young child is learning to walk, and the mother 
clears off everything off the tabletops that a child could tip over, get, you know, harm themselves with. You might say child proofs the house and then lets the child crawl over to a chair and then climb up the chair and stand up. And since the child is learning, the child falls over and maybe gets scared and starts to cry. And the mother is very attentive. And if the child cries a lot or if it's very strong, she might go over there, pick the child up, comfort it, kiss the owie, and then let the child back down again and let the child continue learning how to stand up and walk. The other kind of mother is more like a drill sergeant. As the child is walking around, first of all, it's not childproof. There's all kinds of things a child could knock off the table and break or hurt themselves with. This drill sergeant says, oh, you're never going to do this right. You're going to fall. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to break something. Yada, 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 yada. Of course, that can cause all kinds of problems. But we frequently have that kind of mother inside of us instead of nurturing us, giving us all kinds of negative feedback. There's a Tibetan saying, if you have a warm spot in your heart for yourself, you will be comfortable wherever you go. So we need to nurture that warm spot in our heart so that we can be comfortable wherever we go. The question is, how does talk therapy fit into this? It depends on how you approach it. It can be counterproductive, or it can be get help, let go. This is my own analysis. You can be a victim You could be a survivor, or you could be an experiencer. A victim defines themselves on the basis of a particular experience or group of experiences. And that's a very important part of their identity. A survivor, again, defines themselves by this part of their experience. And that's who they are, or a big part of who they are. An experiencer is a person that has experienced something or a group of experiences, but they have had a wide range of experiences throughout their lives, and they're not defined by a strong emotion or a negative group of experiences. And there are different kinds of talk therapy. Frequently, when you join a support group, you just go over and over the sorts of things that everybody in the group have experienced, but there is not much discussion of how do we avoid defining ourselves by what this group is formed around. I have seen therapists, psychiatrists. What helped me the most was not, and it was helpful to see them. I'm not saying don't. But what helped me the most was when I got motivated to start being mindful of what was going on in my mind and let go of the negativity and let go of all the negative input that I was putting into my mind, which was negative books, negative news, negative music, and my negative attitudes. You might say I I went on a diet and I quit listening and quit reading and quit talking about all this negativity. And it was amazing how much better I felt. I remember talking to my therapist, saying, well, I have a friend of mine that says I should join a group that goes into this area that was bothering me. And my therapist said, nah, you're wasting your time. You're above that. The question is, how does practicing a mantra and distracting you from negative thoughts differ from distraction by watching a football game or going shopping or going out to the bar. Repeating the mantra is virtuous, and you're creating merit, good karma, by repeating the mantra. 
and you're not having any negative thoughts if you're really concentrating on the mantra. If you're watching a football game or at a bar or going out and shopping, you're going to be engaging in more afflictive states of mind, desire, maybe anger at the other team when they make a touchdown, and so on and so forth. That here you're focusing your mind on virtuous behavior.